year, Wear Red Day, a day where women throughout the country and throughout the world unite to take control of their health and to focus on the fact that heart disease is the greatest health threat of women in this country and worldwide. And I am joined today by some incredible guests, and let me introduce them to you. First of all, Susan Lucci. Um, Susan is an Emmy award-winning actress, a national ambassador for Go Red for Women, and a heart disease survivor, and we'll hear more about that uh, in just a moment. Star Jones, uh, also uh, award-winning uh, television personality, national volunteer for the American Heart Association, and a heart disease survivor. And Dr. Jessica Mega, who is a co-founder um, and leader of science and medicine at Verily Life Sciences, a Google company, and a very important strategic partner with the American Heart Association. So let me start by asking each of you, what does Wear Red Day mean to you? And Star, you've been at this longest, so let me start with you. Well, this is a special celebration for me. This is the almost 10th anniversary of my open heart surgery. So I wear red or I go red because 10 years ago they took my heart out of my body and because of the science and research of the AHA and the skill of some pretty brilliant doctors, they could put it back in. Yeah. So I go red not just one day, you know, but the entire month yes. of February. And we're having fun this month because there are 29 days in February, so extra. we get an extra day to wear red. <laughs> Susan, what does this day mean to you? Oh, means much the same to me as it does to Star. I feel so grateful, so incredibly lucky to be a survivor. I did not have open heart surgery the way my sister survivor Star did, uh, but I wound up having, uh, unbeknownst to me, suddenly, a 90% blockage in my main artery and a 75% blockage in uh, an adjacent artery. And I avoided, by going to the hospital, I avoided the widow maker. So I am so lucky to be here and so happy to be able to share whatever my experience has been with you. Thank you so much, Susan, and we are so happy you got the treatment that yes. you needed. And we're gonna talk more about what women can do in just a moment. Dr. Mega, what does today mean to you and wear red day? Well, it is an absolute gift to be a cardiologist. It brings joy. We work with so many patients. But at the same time, as you've already heard today, one in three women are affected by cardiovascular disease. And the importance of days like today is to remind people of that, both on the clinical care side and what are the questions that we still need to answer. Yeah, and it's so important, Dr. Mega, to think about the questions that still need to be answered because what we know is that although we've made great strides in women understanding that heart disease is their greatest health threat, Millions of women still don't understand that. So that's one problem we need to solve. But secondly, women present um, with their heart symptoms much differently than men, and women often are not receiving optimal treatment. And together, the American Heart Association and Verily are trying to fix that problem. Could you talk a little bit about what we're doing? Well, this has been so important to us because if you think about it, anytime we understand people with disease, we have to understand the diversity of symptoms that someone may have. And women do have very particular symptoms. The other thing is anytime you have a new medicine, a new device, a new digital therapy, we have to have evidence to know that it's going to work. So what we did together with the American Heart Association is launch a community. And the community is called Research Goes Red. And for anyone who wants to join, if you go to projectbaseline.com slash go red, you can be part of this community. It's bringing people together, clinicians, advocacy groups, health systems, to understand why women have heart disease and how we can best take care of them. Wonderful, thank you. And as we're having this conversation here, we encourage you to submit your questions as well because we'd love to hear what's on your mind. Star and Susan, let me ask both of you this. How did you find out you had heart disease and what did it feel like when your doctor told you? Star? Well, I think back on this moment, um, I had, for most people who know me, I had been obese or morbidly obese for the vast majority of my adult life. And so when I decided to have weight loss surgery back in 2003 with the help of my doctors, I ended up losing over half of my body weight. I got down to 147 pounds. I lost 160 pounds. And so all of the excuses that I used to put on the shoulders of, oh, well, I'm overweight, I could no longer ignore anymore. So after I changed my life, lost the weight, started exercising, eating correctly, 
I noticed some strange symptoms. I was getting very intense heart palpitations, like someone was punching me in the chest. When I'd go from seated to standing too quickly, I would get lightheaded. And then the fatigue would set in. And I'm not talking tired like women usually get tired. I'm talking fatigue like you can't get out of the bed. So I listened to my body and went in to see my cardiologist. And the cardiologist listened to my symptoms and for two days put me through a battery of tests to result in the heart disease diagnosis that resulted in open heart surgery. So I guess my message is I didn't know I didn't think about heart disease as something that I needed to worry about, although my life screamed heart disease. My background, my family history screamed heart disease, like a lot of our women out there. But I then said, oh, if I've got to be the new face of heart disease, it's not an old white guy's disease, it's a woman's disease. So that's why I've taken on Go Red. Yes, you have. For the past 10 years, you have taken it on. And your new sister, Susan, oh, yes. tell us, uh, you were surprised and maybe even ignored a little bit your early symptoms. Tell these women that are watching us today so that you can help them understand. Thank you. That is exactly why I, I wanted to be part of, of Go Red for Women in the American Heart Association, because I had no idea. I had never had a health issue, but about just a little over a year ago, a year ago in October, uh, my husband and I were at a restaurant waiting to be seated. I had a mild, mild pressure on my chest, uh, radiating around my rib cage to my back. I thought, well, that's odd, but it's not a big deal. And like most women, I thought, oh, it'll go away. It's nothing. And it did by the time we were seated. The same thing happened about a week later in another restaurant. Yes, we like to go out to restaurants. <laughs> so we, we all do. We yes. all do. So, but the same thing happened. But the Last week of October, uh, some, a symptom appeared that I could no longer ignore. Uh, I was shopping for a birthday present for a girlfriend. As the saleswoman stepped aside to wrap it, I felt what I had been so lucky to hear another woman give an interview about years ago. I don't even know why I remembered, and I had no reason to remember. As I said, I had never had a health issue. But suddenly, I felt, as she did, a woman's symptoms, I felt like an elephant was pressing on my chest. And it was radiating around my back, around my rib cage. And because I was out, I sat down on this little bench, and the manager came over to me and asked if I was OK. And I said, I was just trying to assess what was going on. She asked what I was feeling. I told her I felt like an elephant was pressing on my chest. Lucky me, the saleswoman also had a degree in nursing. And she said very calmly, my car's right outside. Why don't I drive you to St. Francis Hospital, which is one of the leading heart hospitals, again, incredible good luck, a mile down the road. And so she did. And I was so grateful to her. I got in her car, grateful, knew how lucky I was. I guess there was something going on, although I couldn't quite believe it. And at the same time, I was saying to myself, but I have too much to do. This is my free day. I have to do this and then go here and go there. I don't have time for this. I have too much to do. And I think a lot of we women, this is what we think. We are not on our own to-do list. I also thought, well, this symptom is going to pass too. And by the time I got to the ER, it had passed as well. But I went into the ER, and this wonderful, brilliant cardiologist, we're very lucky to have been in such good hands, uh, gave me a CAT scan. He compared my numbers. I had just had my yearly checkup two months earlier. Uh, the numbers all matched. The numbers were all still good. My blood pressure at that point, which is usually very low, was high. That was a different number. But he also gave me a CAT scan and came out and told us that I had a 90% blockage in my main artery and a 75% blockage in the adjacent artery. In my case, it was not cholesterol. All the numbers had been checked off as excellent. For me, uh, I inherited my dad's DNA for calcium buildup in, in my, my arteries. I always thought it was just his Italian coloring that I, I got. <laughs> but I got his DNA for heart, too. Uh, my mother is 102. She will be 103 in March. It's amazing. Which is amazing, and I have every yes. confidence that she will be. Until Incredible. recently, she was still wearing leopard kitten heels. Oh, I love it. <laughs> she it will runs make in the it family. It runs in the family. So anyway, we thought I had my mother's genes. 
and it turns out that I had my dad's. And Dr. Mega, I know that you can certainly speak to family history being just as important as any other aspect. It is so important, and thank you for sharing that story with everyone today. We know that we're, we're made up of DNA. We're made up of predisposition to different conditions. And some of those conditions are conditions that we understand, so we're understanding more about certain genetic variants that carry what we call full penetrance, so you develop heart disease very early, sometimes even at the stage of birth. But other people have a series of genetic changes that predispose them to heart disease over their lifetime. The other thing that we know is there's certain genetic variants that may affect your cholesterol or your blood pressure. And so the more we understand through projects like Research Goes Red, the better we'll be able to do to get ahead of all this. And so that is why we're so excited to be here. I love what you're talking about, about research, because I am shocked that in the year 2020, many times women are not even included in the clinical studies. Yeah. It's such an important point. On one hand, I am thrilled that as a cardiac community, and Nancy certainly can speak to this from the AHA, we've made huge strides. We've made strides in cardiovascular mortality, recurrent myocardial infarction. We have new medicines that lower blood pressure, that thin the blood. We have surgery. We have stents that do help people. But there is so much more we can do. I bet every person listening today know someone that has a heart condition where we don't have all of the answers. And that's why we have to continue to explore. And again, that's, uh, that's why I get up every day. And how do we get uh, over sort of the stigma of research and the fear of research? Women don't like to have intrusiveness into their lives. And particularly African Americans are a little hesitant to be involved in research. Well, how can we encourage women and minorities to look at research as another tool for helping their health? It's such an important question. For me, it comes back to the why. Why would we want a diverse community, whether it's women or other people involved in research? And the reason why is we want to make sure that those medicines, those devices, those procedures work for everyone, not just a subset of the population. So we owe it to ourselves to be part of this. But then you bring up an important point about transparency and allowing people to understand what they're contributing. Some people may want to fill out a survey. Maybe people want to contribute based on their family history. Other people are in this mission to think very deeply about their health. One of the projects we're working on, the Project Baseline Health Study, is taking a very deep dive, and we're working with participants to think about next generation health. But we have to start from the beginning of why we're doing what we're doing. And it's really interesting, when we launched Research Goes Red, we wanted this community to be of the community and by the community. So we asked the very large group of participants who uh, signed up uh, with our initial recruitment, what matters to you? What do you care about? And these women cared about weight, they cared about stress, and they cared about sleep. And so we're putting our resources together and we're conducting a very deep study on weight but we're doing many surveys in some of these other areas. And so I think, Star, the point you raise is very important, that we need to meet people where they are and give everyone a chance to contribute. And you know, one of the things um, that, Susan, you mentioned, and I see we have a question from the audience as well about the importance of knowing our family history. And you know, if we think about the power of our families and the people that we you know, were raised by and that we love, you know, the power of knowledge and information and not letting the moment slip before you gather that stuff is really important. I don't know how many of you have gathered family history stuff around medical conditions, but it's important. Star, I think oh. you did that after you were diagnosed. Absolutely, because again, I had my head in the sand about the risk of heart disease, but again, I should have been screaming, I am a candidate because of my family history. Um, four generations of women that I can track have had heart disease in my family. My mom, a year and a half ago, actually passed away, ultimately, from cardiovascular disease. Um, my grandmother, um, who I lost last year also, but at 99 years old, she had, in her 80s, a triple bypass. And my youngest aunt, my mother's generation, she's now had bypass surgery and a heart attack. I've had women throughout my family who um, have had heart disease issues. 
but I still didn't think of it as a risk. And I'm supposed to be Miss Smarty Pants. And so I want to encourage other women to just look at their family background, also look at your lifestyle. I was sedentary, I was not eating correctly for the vast majority of my life. And so that right there screams heart disease brighter and louder than anything. You know, much like you, Star, I did not pay attention to family history. I don't know, I guess because I never had a health issue, and I guess I just paid attention to the fact that my mother had always been so healthy. Uh, so it's important to look at both, both sides of your family. Also, I knew that the particular thing about my dad is that he smoked Luckies. He smoked Lucky Strikes with no filter my whole life. Uh, so I thought, well, I'm not a smoker. I've never been a smoker. Therefore, there's no connection here. Um, it's, it's interesting, and I know that the research is going to show all those interesting things that women can be, can be uh, aware of. This is something, this question uh, that came from Facebook um, has, has occurred to me. And the question is, how can I work in my community and help the American Heart Association? Yes, and the one just that I, I happen to look up and see on the screen is, how can I find out my family history if I've been adopted? Yes. And I, I, I thought, how lucky I am that I can look to uh, some of those things in my family. And yeah, we would look to the women in our family. Usually, in my case, it was my dad. You know, there's got to be so much to this. But yes, for, the, for those of you who, who maybe cannot, for one reason or another, check your family history, I'm going to say the importance of screening. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Dr. Maggie, you might like to add on that. I was I, just going to say, because I'd love for us to talk about what can all women do, including screening. Yes. I think it's so important because we talk about this interaction, there's genes and then there's the environment. And I think we've heard so nicely about all of the things that we can be doing proactively for our health. Thinking about activity, understanding our cholesterol, understanding our blood pressure. These are things that are knowable. The other concept that we've already started to talk about today is paying attention to your symptoms, paying attention to your body. In both cases, you all shared beautiful stories where your body was experiencing symptoms but there's research coming out of different areas suggesting that women actually wait longer before they go and seek medical help. If so I had been home a lot that to do. day, I never would have gone to the hospital. I know I would have just thought, oh, I probably need to have some water and lay down for a little while. And now I know that I wouldn't have woken that up. That would have been a tragic ending. Yeah. yeah. So yes, if your body is behaving in a way, I believe, that is not normal for you and your body, uh, then do something, call 911, get yourself to the hospital. Something too that's been mentioned a bit is stress. And I think the total wellness, the total wellness is something that's going to fuel women and give them the opportunity to um, be empowered to stop whatever's going on, whatever the diagnosis is, whether it's cholesterol or whether it's calcium or whatever the cause. Nancy, you know this is something that we've talked about many times. Women literally will be writhing on the floor in their own homes, experiencing symptoms that scare them to death. But because the kitchen isn't clean, we'll not call 911 right. exactly. so that the uh, emergency responders can get there to them. Or, like Susan says, she had things to do. That was her free day. She had to run around. She didn't have time for a heart issue. I had a lunch meeting at my favorite restaurant in New York. That you, yes. That I, ta it takes forever to get a, re a reservation there. but. I had to go to the hospital. Yes. I had to check myself in. We will, if our children get a sniffle or our husband complains of a hangnail, we will make sure they see a doctor. But again, we will be writhing on the floor, right. foaming at the mouth, and if the kitchen isn't clean, we won't put ourselves at the top of the list. That is so well said. That is star. very well exactly. said. Exactly. And also, we think often that the doctor will think we're overreacting. Yes. Uh, or in my case, if they saw Erica Kane, they would say, oh, she's being too dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can you know. speak of, for the yes. medical community. We want to hear what people are feeling. We are here to receive this. There's right. so much momentum and enthusiasm to understand broadly heart conditions. So please, please reach out to your, to your physicians. Well, they and want if you help. And if you're having you know, chest pain or things that are unusual for your body, do not die of doubt. You know, activate 911. Call to get the help that you need so that you can be sure you have more time with your family and your loved ones. I want to switch a little bit about lifestyle. So we've talked about these two amazing women who have devoted their lives to helping all of us uh, pay attention to our bodies and understand that heart disease is our greatest health threat. For some women, 
Um, you know, it's not something on their mind, but maybe there are some lifestyle things that could help them live and extend their life. And so we know things like physical activity, eating properly, avoiding the use of tobacco products of any sort at all costs are important. And Dr. Mega, I wonder if you could talk about why are these things important? Why does lifestyle matter? And what are some tips maybe that all of us might have for women to be able to do these things? So as we started to talk about today, there are certain genetic factors that we have, but environment matters. So if you think about cholesterol, for example, cholesterol can end up affecting the coronary arteries, so those are the pipes that bring blood to the heart. And if those levels get high, there's LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, there's HDL, that's the good cholesterol. If the LDL levels get too high, then you start to have buildup in those arteries. So it's a very tangible example of diet can reduce those cholesterol levels. Many people need medications as well, so I wanna make sure that we understand and don't make people feel badly if they're on medications. There's been so much progress on that front to reduce cardiovascular disease. And then we also started to talk today about stress. And the more we understand, stress is not an amorphous concept. We know that stress actually changes the immune system. And so we're starting to think not only about the concept of stress as a mental condition, but what is the downstream physiological effects. And the more, going back to Research Goes Red and the work that we're doing with Project Baseline and with the AHA, this is where we're gonna start to make some real breakthroughs. I think so. And you know, we have a question here from one of our viewers, Amy, who's asking, how does food influence my heart health and how do we know what to eat? And so we know at the American Heart Association um, that diets that are low in fat and saturated fat and filled with fresh fruits and vegetables and a colorful you know, plate, protein. <laughs> yeah. a colorful plate, yeah, the colorful, plate colorful plate, exactly. You know, that really matters. And if you go to goread.org, you will find um, information on healthy eating. We have lots of recipes. And what we often say is food should be fun. Like how can we enjoy the food that we're eating well, it's healthy. Um, you know, we love uh, hearing from our communities throughout the country of families that are cooking together again because the whole family is committing to eat healthier. And, you know, there are ways to eat healthy when you're dining out, as all of us enjoy doing, and there are really ways to eat healthy when you're cooking for yourself and, and for your And dining family. out, Nancy, I can tell you because this is something like, like Susan that I do quite often and traveling. Uh, to locations that are not home where I have my own kitchen. Um, I learned portion control that it actually works for me. Every time I'm at a, ho at a, at a restaurant, I have my plate. I do that too. And, yeah. and, but I actually send it away. I have it boxed up, half of it, before I even start eating because, one, I know I'm looking forward to that next meal with that leftover, I like <laughs> a leftover. But number two, if I've boxed it up, I'm not even tempted to go back in that box yeah. and eat some more. And, and American portions can tend to be much larger um, than uh, uh, portions outside of our country. So you can do half. And not, not one time in the last 15 years have I ever gone back in that box and taken anything out. Yeah. When, when you're home, do the same thing. Because most people are a little lazy. Once you leave the kitchen, don't eat in the kitchen from the pot. Make a plate. Go sit down at a table. Most people are too lazy to get back up and get some more food out of the pot if you put the food away. I yeah, also, that's a good that's idea. Really good tip. I, I have to say, I also remember when my children were little, and I, I, had to, I learned this by experience, so I was feeding them at a much earlier time, but of course I loved what they were eating, and um, I cooked everything myself. It was all organic, but, but it was early, and so you could wind up. I said to myself, you know, you're starting to eat two dinners, this is not really good. I'd read again when my husband came home. So that portion control, that, uh, that can really um, be important. One thing, too, I would say about restaurants now around the country, most places, they've made it a lot easier for us to make healthy choices. You know, they're, look around. It may not be what they list as entree and all those particular ingredients, but you can ask for the sauce on the side. You can, if you really need to have that sauce, you can just dip your fork in. You'd be surprised same how much. Same with salad dressing. Right, yes. same with salad dressing, Absolutely. everything on the side. Uh, you can also forego it. Um, I will say that my husband has learned to say no to the waiter when they come and ask you if you, you know, they put the dinner rolls down or some yes. bread. He'll say, no, thank you, and they take it away. That has had a big impact on 
on yeah. his way. Yeah, these are ways we can, can uh, take control of what we're eating. Let's talk about physical activity for a moment. You know, physical activity really matters in um, being healthy, being heart healthy, and also feeling great in general. Um, and I'd love for each of us to talk about, you know, everyday ways that people who are um, with us today can get physical activity that don't require expensive gym memberships. Star, I'm going to start with you. Well, um, this is probably the thing that I do that um, people ask me about the most. I literally schedule my exercise as a part of my daily calendar. Um, I have my, I, I, I'm legendary poly planner is what my friends and family call me. So I planned out three months of advan in advance all of my travel. I know what I'm doing this quarter. So I started to treat exercise the same way. I've signed up for my tennis lessons already, and that means I've paid for them. I've signed up for my Pilates classes on every Tuesday and every Thursday. I have to consciously cancel the class because I've already signed up for it. Yeah. I've built in my exercise to my life. So I don't believe in work-life balance. I believe in work-life integration. And physical exercise has become integrated into my life because the result is not one that I want. I was listening to the doctor talk to us about lowering your cholesterol. Well, I know for a fact, the research says, exercise is one way to keep your cholesterol under control without having to utilize pharmaceuticals. That's right. So and that, stress. That's it's also stress, stress management. So it, it manages your stress, because there's nothing better than punching a bag when you got a little stress. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that's great. Uh, the other thing, I love this idea of integration. And so if you have stairs uh, around you, take the stairs. If you can park a little bit further and right. walk, we have uh, stairs in our office and we actually have a chart and people will put a little notch by, by the amount of stairs that they take. And so idea. I think the more we integrate physical activity into our lives based on what our body can handle, the better we'll be. Yeah, Susan, what do you do to stay physically active? Oh, I, I do Pilates and I feel so lucky that, that I, this has been in my life for about 25 years. Uh, it came into my life because there was a front page article on the New York Times uh, saying who was most susceptible to um, getting osteoporosis when they got older and I was the exact person they were uh, di saying, describing, uh, small boned, petite, and uh, you have to do weight bearing exercises. I always, you know, we skied in the winter, played tennis, like you said, and I, I'm not sedentary, I'm, I hardly sit down, so I thought, well, I'm fine, but they said the magic thing, weight bearing, and I thought, okay, I need to check this out. And so I found um, a trainer in my hometown, I don't live in the city, I live uh, about an hour outside the city, uh, I had heard about her, but I didn't know her, just heard she was good, she was great. Uh, in fact, I started doing Pilates when it was so new, I thought it was called Pilates. Oh, there you go. I'm glad, you're, I'm, glad I'm not the only one. You know, one of the things that I do always is walk, and I think, Dr. Mega, the advice you gave, you know, it's so easy today to, to you know, rush, rush, rush here, there, and everywhere. We're on our phones, we're on our computers, and it's easy to stay seated. But getting up and moving, and if you're doing nothing, to just do a little something, you know, you don't don't have to go from nothing to running a marathon. You don't ever have to run a marathon. You know, getting up and moving around um, really matters to lowering our risk. And one of the things that is important to know is that when we think about being healthy overall, you know, these things kind of work together. We like to call them life simple seven. You know, the seven health factors and health behaviors that really define your overall heart health but actually your overall health in general. And these things are, you know, to make sure that we're eating a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, colorful plates, as Star said, that we are getting the appropriate amounts of physical activity, that we're avoiding tobacco at all costs, and that we know our risk factors. Do we know what our blood pressure is? Do we know what our blood sugar is? Do we understand what our cholesterol levels are? And is our body mass index, you know, the, the ratio of our weight and height um, at the appropriate level? And those things, Life Simple 7, work together to help us um, have a, a, a positive outlook on life. Now, Dr. Mega, we have a question on pregnancy and postpartum um, 
depression uh, on heart health. Could you uh, help us understand, I think we do know that from research, that pregnancy can be a risk factor for women developing heart disease in some cases. And I would love for you to talk about that. This is a common question that we get. So around the time when women are pregnant and after that period, there can be what we call postpartum or peripartum cardiomyopathy, which essentially means weakening of the heart muscle. There has been a tremendous amount of interest in this area. I thank, uh, I thank Jenny who sent the question in. I would argue that we need to continue to do even more research, so you're hearing that today. We've made, we have made good strides, and, and the most important thing is people start to understand the symptoms. But I, I really want to put a plug into this idea that there is much more to know. So thank you for, for bringing that up, and we'll continue to, to talk about this. Uh, I will say there are some, if you're someone who has been diagnosed, there are therapies and there's follow-up, so make sure you do uh, look into that. The American Heart Association has wonderful resources, so certainly take a look there. You I know, wanted Nancy, to I, say, oh, I'm so sorry, just, just before we get away from the, the exercise aspect, um, so I do Pilates, I do Pilates about six days a week, and uh, I have a, a chair that I work out on with Pilates, which gives you some cardio too. And uh, along this time, while I've been doing this, many women ask me, well, what about the stress on your joints? What about the stress here and there? Uh, Pilates, I find to be low to no stress on, on your joints, which is also good long term. But if you do nothing else, I would say stretch. Because when you're stretching, you're breathing. And this is also very, uh, very advantageous. Even if you're going to go then, try to run a marathon. You, you, the stretching part is, I think, very important. and makes you feel good, too, in that overall sense of wellness and well-being, the breathing that goes with that. We always say, if you look at your dog or your cat, the first thing they do when they stand up straight is they stretch out. You know, so <laughs> why don't we do that as humans? Exactly. We tell, yeah. I always tell about my Mimi. She's doing her Pilates. Yes, exactly. <laughs> my girls do their Pilates, so, too. So, Nancy, something that, you know, as we talk about the kinds of exercise we do, I want to make sure we emphasize for those who don't have access to gyms, um, that don't have access to uh, exercise machines. Um, I've heard of, a, of groups of women who do window shopping walking, which is fantastic oh, to go like through the yeah. mall. Yeah. And you go through the two or three or four floors of the mall and do window shopping. When I was a little girl, um, that's when the JCPenney and the Sears catalog used to come to the house. I'm from North Carolina, just like the doctor here, so we know this. <laughs> so we would go, and I would go through the catalog and say, I'm going to have this living room, I'm going to put these curtains in, and I'm going to have this like chair. Were you like eight at the time? Or I was, yeah. you, yeah. you know me, my yeah. precocious self. But do the same thing while you're walking through the mall. You can pick out, I think I want that dress for the party that I'm going to next week. Even if you don't buy anything, which I'm not encouraging to spend a bunch of money, but walk around uh, the mall with your girlfriends and you will end up getting your steps done before you even know yeah. it. That's a great idea. I also think going with your girlfriends, whether you're walking in the mall, which is really fun, uh, or walking out in nature, you have a lot of laughs too with your friends. And I think that helps. Yes, laughter really matters. And I think this idea of connectedness matters. You know, one thing that we recognize in society today is a lot of people are really lonely. And, you know, so reaching out and helping others, volunteering, being part of a community matters. And here we are having a Facebook Live, and Facebook is a big community of people who are connected with each other. And Dr. Mega, you might talk about, from a scientific standpoint, I think we know that being connected with other people really matters in terms of your overall health outcomes. Well, it matters in many ways. Uh, in some ways, even the physical nature of you being out and about and having friends in a community that can recognize symptoms, sometimes the people that, that are most honest with you are your friends and family. But we're also starting to understand that there are downstream effects of being lonely and even having hope. And so sometimes these, these concepts may seem amorphous, but we're actually, there are studies looking at cancer, looking at heart disease, and understanding what those social networks mean. And I would make a plug for, for really connecting with people in, in a way that is, that is meaningful and deep. I think there's many wonderful things about technology today, but we want to make sure we use it to bring people together. In fact, that's one of the, the things I'm most excited about Research Goes Red, of bringing a community together 
digitally, but then creating units where people can get together one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I'm looking at one of the questions that we got, um, Nancy, from Molly. I lost my mother to heart disease. How do women get doctors to pay attention to our heart health? And um, I, I, I'm a pretty boisterous person. Susan uh, is someone who will be taken seriously when she walks in a the room. There are a number of women who get intimidated when they go in to their doctor's office. And one of the things I advise women to do is to make a list of the things that you have questions about, that you've sat around with your friends, and you know you're much bolder when you're talking to your friends. <laughs> so use that list, that boldness to make the list, and go in when you speak to your doctor, him or her, and specifically say, you know what, I made a list of some things that are concerning me. So it's not that you are confronting the doctor, but you are bringing the doctor into your process. I'm gonna steal from my friend Beyonce. She's usually very shy in her personal life, but publicly she's Beyonce. She embraces her inner Sasha Fierce is what she says. That oh. is <laughs> who she is on that stage, Sasha Fierce. So when you go to the doctor, I want you to embrace your inner Sasha Fierce. Go in there like the fierce woman you are. You can come back out and be shy again, but when you're in there advocating for yourself, be Sasha. Yes, that's a, that, is a, that is a great tip. And I think we know through our work and our research, we have to continue to help our healthcare providers understand that when women present, heart disease can happen to any woman at any time at any age. And so this is again part of our work in gathering more evidence so that doctors can see that young women can have heart disease, our mothers can have heart disease, our grandmothers can have heart disease. Heart disease does not discriminate. And so as we wrap up today, this has been a fun conversation. I know we could sit here all afternoon and, and we just might, but in terms of being um, on Facebook Live, I would love to get your parting thoughts of what you would like these wonderful women and men um, who are watching us today, what would you like them to know? Susan, let me start with you. Well, first of all, I knew how lucky I was to uh, survive this potential widow maker. And I just couldn't keep that good luck to myself. I knew that I had to pass it forward as best I could. What my experience was, because I heard the generosity of another woman many years ago talk about the difference in women's symptoms from men's, I thought, well, maybe if I tell my story in modern times, now maybe one woman out there will say, I feel an elephant pressing on my chest. Women's symptoms are different than a man's. As I said, I felt I have too much to do. And I think, most women, this is, most of us women think we are not on our to-do list. I have to take care of this, I have to take care of that, I have to do this for my child, this for my husband, this for the house, this for my career. No, you have to be up there, put yourself on your to-do list, way up here. Just like in the airplane when the oxygen mask comes down and it says put it on yourself first and then you can help the person next exactly. to you. That's, that's what I'd like you to do, that's a big takeaway. I feel from my experience that I can pass forward. The other thing is, and it's been mentioned here as well, if your body is not behaving the way that is normal for you, pay attention. You may not be as lucky as I was to be out in a place where someone could help me right away. You may be by yourself, you may be home alone. Call 911, don't hesitate. The other thing that I think is a lot of women can probably identify with was my trepidation going to the doctor, thinking, Oh, he will, he, this, he'll think I'm overreacting. And I was afraid that I'd be taking this wonderful cardiologist away from the patients who really needed him. Put you yourself, needed him. I did, and you I didn't realize him. it. So these are things you can be proactive on. Please don't, don't just sit down and don't throw your hands up. I'm not a believer in throwing your hands up. Don't throw your hands up. Take care of yourself. Use those hands to dial 911 or get yourself to the hospital. Thank you, Susan. Dr. Mega, what would you leave us with? Well, it's a great follow on to physicians are here to help. Come and be a proactive partner with us. Thank you for your stories today. I think that we've made such amazing strides in heart disease. I thank the AHA, but there is a call to action. There is more we can do. Please check out projectbaseline.com slash go red. We are here to make a difference. Thank you, Dr. Mega. Star. 
Nancy, I've been doing this a long time, and it always comes down to health equities. I want our communities to all have the same access to the same resources that Susan and I had. So advocate for yourself and advocate for the health of others in your community, in your family. Um, eat less, move more. Those are the two takeaways that I've learned can really save lives. And they, that, that is wonderful advice, and it does save lives. And uh, again, thank you so much to Susan, to Star, thank to you. Jessica, and to all of you who have watched today in this amazing Go Red for Women community. We are so proud at the American Heart Association to have this platform and these incredible leaders to help bring the message and through our partnership with uh, Project Baseline and Verily to provide solutions to help all women have equal access and longer, healthier lives. Enjoy the rest of Wear Red Day. If you don't have red on already, please put <laughs> some on. Talk to the women in your life. Make sure that they know to take care of their hearts, to take care of their health, and to go red and enjoy today. Thank go you red. so much. Go red. Go red. Go red. Go red. Go red.